Hello and welcome to the news from Bahrain International. I'm Sarah al -Fatih. His Royal Highness the Prime Minister Prince Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa received at Rafah Palace the newly appointed Italian Ambassador to Bahrain, Paola Amadie. His Royal, His Royal Highness the Premier congratulated Ambassador Amadie on her appointment to her post, wishing her every success in carrying out her diplomatic duties so as to further bolster relations between the two friendly countries. The Prime Minister affirmed the Kingdom's keenness to enhance its cooperation with Italy across various fields. The Italian the envoy expressed sincere thanks and appreciation to His Royal Highness the Premier for his support and interest in boosting bilateral cooperation in various sectors. She also conveyed to His Royal Highness the Prime Minister the greetings and appreciation of the Italian government for the efforts he is making to enhance the level of cooperation between the two friendly countries. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Abdel Latif bin Rashid Zayani, participated in the extraordinary session of the Council of the Arab League on Libya held remotely, chaired by the Sultanate of Oman's Minister responsible for Foreign Affairs, Yusuf bin Alawi bin Abdullah, and with the participation of the Secretary General of the Arab League, Ahmed Abu Ghid. During the meeting, the Minister of Foreign Affairs delivered a speech in which he stressed that the situation in Libya is concerning and reflects the state of division in the Arab world and regional an international conflict which reflected negatively on Libya and its people, neighboring countries, Arab national security and the region, especially in light of the continued follow flow of weapons and armed militia and mercenaries to Libyan hands, financial financing from some countries and clear media support, which led to an increase in the division between the parties to the conflict in Libya and the intensified battles. Zayani reiterated Bahrain's affirmation on the need to adhere to the unity, sovereignty, territorial integrity and stability of Libya and its firm and supportive stance to all efforts aimed at rebuilding the Libyan state and to address all forms of terrorism and eliminate terrorist groups to meet the aspirations of the Libyan people to develop, advance and live in security and stability. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Abdel Latif bin Rajd Zayani, participated through video conference in the extraordinary session of the Council of the Arab League on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, headed by Oman's Minister responsible for Foreign Affairs, Yusuf bin Alawi bin Abdullah, with the participation to the Secretary General of the Arab League, Ahmed Abu Ghid. The Foreign Affairs delivered a speech during the meeting in which he affirmed that the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam issue is a major challenge for our border security, which is considered one of the basics of Arab national security. He also noted the threats of activating the dam without reaching a just and balanced agreement with Ethiopia. He asserted Bahrain's rejection of any intervention in Egypt and Sudan's historic rights in the Nile River. A previous report issued by the World Bank showed last year that Bahrain has succeeded through its equitable educational programs that include all educational stages in raising the literacy percentage in children and young adults who are able to read Arabic specifically according to international standards to reach 70%. The report indicated that the percentage of school dropouts in the kingdom does not exceed 2% and is one of the lowest percentages in the region and the world at large which affirms that the indicators of progress are high in achieving the fourth goal of the Sustainable Development Goals for the year of 2030, which gave Bahrain the right to lead in the percentage of literacy in the countries of the Middle East and North Africa. 
The Ministry of Health said today that the number of coronavirus cases reached 5,479 with 443 recoveries and 643 registered new cases and two deaths. 371 of the new registered cases are expatriate workers, 262 are contacts of active cases and 10 are travel related. The deceased are 87-year-old and 91-year-old citizens. The Ministry of Health urges everyone to adhere to the rules and affirm the importance of following instructions such as washing one's hands with soap on a regular basis along with avoiding shaking hands and close contact. Moreover, covering the nose and the mouth when sneezing and avoiding public spaces when possible. Saudi officials said that the Hajj pilgrimage, which usually draws up to 2.5 million Muslims from all over the world, will only see at the most a few thousand pilgrims next month due to concerns over the spread of the coronavirus. The kingdom's Hajj minister, Mohammed de Benten, said a small and very limited number of people, even as low as just a thousand from inside the kingdom, will be allowed to perform the pilgrimage to ensure social distancing and crowd control amid the global virus outbreak. While the decision to drastically curb this year's Hajj was largely expected, it remains unprecedented in Saudi Arabia's nearly 90-year-old history and effectively bars all Muslims from outside the kingdom from traveling there to perform the pilgrimage. The Saudi government waited until just five weeks before the Hajj to announce its decision. The timing indicates the sensitivity around major decisions concerning the Hajj that affects Muslims around the world. Saudi Arabia's decision to hold Hajj this year and limited to worshippers residing in the kingdom has received support from various countries across the Middle East. State news agency WAM reported that the UAE Hajj Affairs, the HAO, said it will not take part in this year's Hajj season, adding that the kingdom's decision stems from the preventive and precautionary measures taken to contain the spread of the pandemic and to keep all humans protected and safe from its risks and in accordance with the teachings of Islam in preserving the lives. The Egyptian Minister of Endowments and al Azhar have also welcomed the decision, as well as the ambassador of Djibouti to the kingdom, Dayeddin Bukarma. He said the kingdom's decision to perform Hajj this year was wise. The ambassador said that this decision reflects Saudi Arabia's keenness to hold the right of Hajj and combat and address the coronavirus pandemic because large crowds may be a reason for the continuation of the pandemic and its spread. The Saudi-led coalition to restore legitimacy in Yemen said that it has intercepted and destroyed four ballistic missiles launched by Houthi militias towards Riyadh, Najran and Jazan. The coalition spokesman Colonel Turkil Maliki said in a statement that the terrorist Iran-backed Houthi militia launched yesterday evening eight bomb-laden UAVs targeting civilians and civilian objects in the kingdom, all intercepted and destroyed by joint coalition forces. He added that the continuation of these terrorist uh, hostile acts using bomb-laden UAVs reflects the extreme and unethical ideology of the militia towards innocent civilians. He warned that the joint forces command of the coalition will continue to apply and implement all necessary measures to protect innocent civilians and rigorous and appropriate operational procedures to stop these acts of terror in accordance with the customary international humanitarian law. French President Emmanuel Macron yesterday said that Turkey's attitude in Libya is unacceptable as France sees Ankara as an obstacle to securing a ceasefire in the conflict-torn country. Macron spoke at an evening news conference with Tunisian President Kay Saeed in Paris. Macron urged Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan to end his country's actions in Libya and said that he discussed the issue with U.S. President Donald Trump in a phone call earlier yesterday. The White House said the two Leaders agreed on the urgent need for a ceasefire in Libya and for the rapid resumption of negotiations by the Libyan parties. Trump and Macron reiterated that military escalation on all sides must stop immediately to prevent the Libyan conflict from becoming even more dangerous and intractable. And now we move to Yasmin with the latest business news. Thank you, Sarah.
A very good evening. You're watching the business news on Bahrain International with me, Yasmin Ibrahim. Bahrain All Share Index has closed at 1,280.33 points, marking an increase of 1.81 points above the previous closing. This increase was due to the rise in the commercial bank sector, investment sector, services sector, and industrial sector. 41 equity transactions took place with a volume of 5,671,641 worth 546,926 Bahraini dinars. Investors traded mainly in the investment sector representing 48.31% of the total value of securities traded. Apple provided a glimpse at upcoming software changes designed to make the iPhone even easier to use and announced hardware changes to its line of Mac computers. The preview of the next version of the iPhone's operating system known as iOS 14 took place in virtual form. In recognition of the pandemic, Apple's upgraded software for the Apple Watch will detect when users wash their hands. But, but most of the presentation revolved around micro-sized features that could help users manage their apps better, find new ones and use their phones to unlock their and start their cars remotely. Shopping malls in Peru opened their doors after almost 100 days of being closed. But the shopping centers restricted customers to half the capacity allowed in normal times. The shopping centers prohibited children and the operation of entertainment areas. Before being allowed in, guards took customers' temperatures, disinfected their shoes and poured gel on their hands. Top European Union officials pressed China's leaders to open the country's markets further to European companies and show stronger leadership in reforming the world trade's governing body. We have a dynamic trading relationship with China. We trade on average over 1 billion euros a day. It's huge. And the EU is China's first trading partner. But progress is needed in many areas to rebalance this relationship and we made clear that we need to resolve concrete problems such as market access, subsidies, regulatory issues, public procurement, forced technology transfers, level playing field and WTO reforms. Germany and France urged a rapid compromise on the EU recovery fund in Berlin. The German finance minister said that the close France-German cooperation was vital. It's time to decide now. We need the money now. And we need to support our economies in all European nations now. So it's time to decide. We have everything on the table to provide support to our economies. And the quicker, the better. This is absolutely necessary to find a compromise as soon as possible on this economic recovery plan so that we can get more growth in all European countries as soon as possible. If you put too many conditions on uh, this economic recovery fund, you run the risk of having a fund and a recovery plan that would be less efficient. Efficiency is the key. We need more growth as soon as possible. I wanted also to insist on the fact that from the French side, we remain fully committed to the improvement of the French economic competitiveness. And finally, before we conclude our business news for this evening, let's take a look at how stock markets around the world fared in daily trading. And that is it from the business desk. It's back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Yasmin. A top Afghan government official said that the Taliban killed at least 291 Afghan security personnel over the past week, accusing the insurgents of unleashing a wave of violence ahead of potential talks. The spokesman for the National Security Council said that the previous week was the deadliest in the country's 19 years of conflict, even as the insurgents dismissed the latest figures. The Taliban carried out 422 attacks in 32 provinces during that time, killing 291 security force personnel and 
wounding 550 others. The Taliban rejected the latest government figures. Prime Minister Boris Johnson said today that pubs, restaurants and hotels could reopen in England early next month, easing the coronavirus lockdown that has all but shut the economy. Hairdressers will also open again along with tourist attractions like theme parks, but nightclubs, indoor gyms and swimming pools will have to stay closed. Johnson said with infection rates falling and little current threat of a second wave of COVID-19 cases, he could reopen swathes of the economy and try to get life in England back to something like normal. By Relaxing the rule on social distancing from 2 meters to 1 meter plus, wearing masks and using protective screens, Johnson said many businesses could reopen from July the 4th. He also said that the changes will allow two households to meet in any setting and all schools will reopen in September, adding that laws specifying social contact would be replaced with the new guidance. Johnson said not all restrictions could be lifted at once and people would need to stay vigilant. He cautioned that lockdown measures might need to be reintroduced if there were a second spike. Chinese and Indian military commanders have met for the first time since a confrontation in the Himalayas that left at least 20 soldiers dead. Both countries confirmed today that they had met the previous day. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson said that the two sides had a frank and in-depth exchange of views on the prominent issues in the current border control and agreed to take necessary measures to cool down the situation. The Indian Army said in a statement that commanders' level talks were held at Moldo in a cordial, positive and constructive atmosphere. There was mutual consensus to disengage. India has said that 20 of its soldiers died. China has not released any information on casualties on its side. Meanwhile, restaurants, gyms, swimming pools, libraries and kindergartens resumed operation in Moscow today as the city emerged from a light coronavirus lockdown in place since late March. Moscow mayor announced the ending of lockdown in the Russian capital two weeks ago. He lifted the stay-at-home orders and allowed beauty salons to reopen first. Last week, dental clinics, museums and the outdoor spaces of cafes and restaurants resumed operations. The official reported daily number of new coronavirus infections in Moscow has dropped from over 2,000 to about 1,000. Today, health officials in the city reported 1,081 new infections. In total, Moscow has so far registered 216,095 confirmed coronavirus cases, 36 of Russia's caseload of over 599,000 contagions. The COVID-19 shutdown has severely impacted the tourism industry across much of the world, including Italy. In Tuscany, hiking and ecotourism trips are starting to prove more popular, with Italian tourists opting for a staycation. Nestled in the countryside is the luxury hotel, which lies empty, but for its owner, the Michelin star chef is still unable to reopen her hotel due to the COVID-19 restrictions. Around 70% of her clients are usually from abroad. The owner has decided to reopened the hotel and restaurant on July the 3rd with almost half the season gone. With a strictly reduced staff, only one-third of the rooms will be open for the public. A contraction of this size touches not just specific business but also the average employment rate of the entire area.